Well, let's give them a hand as they come up on the stage. So I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Hey, I'm Mike Ott. I directed the film. Alex Kiyolakis. I produced the film. Uh, Frederick Thornton. I also produced the film. Uh, Nicole Arbusto. I'm the casting director on the film. Yeah, let's give a hand. <laughs> so as we know, it takes a village and an army to make a film happen. So is there anyone cast and crew in the audience you want to acknowledge? Yeah, who's here? Johanna's here. Um, who played this? So you want to stand up, Jojo? <laughs> Roberto's here somewhere, where are you? Uh, Viejito. And, and Eloy's here. Eloy, where'd you go? Are you in the back? Okay, there's Eloy's in the back. Too. So for those in the audience, um, part of the reason we do the independent film series is to encourage the actors in the audience to create their own work by sharing the examples of people who've been there and done it and hopefully will be doing it again. And as we all know, the film starts with script and story. Can Mikey share a little bit about how that got started? Um, well, we didn't really have much of a script. We had more of like an outline, which was like kind of scenes and some dialogue, um, which I think we threw most of it out once we shot. Um, and loosely, some of it was based, I teach the summer school program at CalArts for uh, high school kids. And one of my, where's Christopher? Are you here, Christopher? Yeah. Rojas. Rojas, yeah. And Chris <clears throat> had this great story about coming over the border and getting stuck in a drop house, which I'd never heard about. So a lot of kind of the initial idea came from like hearing Chris's story. And then from there, we kind of just like made up things that I thought were interesting. And I wanted to work with Roberto in a, in a bigger way. Thanks. And then you had a writing partner. Can you, how did you guys know each other? How did that happen? Uh, I mean, it's a complicated uh, situation, but um, um, yeah, I mean, we had written, uh, this is our third film that we wrote together, but again, it's kind of, I, I wouldn't say it's so much writing, I mean, we kind of like came up with a bunch of ideas, and then when we were on set, we kind of changed them all. Nice, and give a shout out to who, who helped you with that? Uh, Atsuko Okatsuka. Nice. Um, so then, story, loose scripts, ideas, and then when did you kind of like, okay, it's time to start pre-production and get grow the team, when was kind of that transition? Um, we had written like a short version. I think the, the first part of the movie that we shot ended when, oh, I think it ended when yeah. Eloy picks her up in the van and they drive off and that was like the... We weren't even sure where the story was gonna go after that point. We weren't sure who we were gonna follow. Yeah. It was supposed to be, what, three different short stories, I think? Yeah, so originally I was gonna do like three shorts that were all kind of like set in this location. Mm -hmm. Um, but we shot, this, uh, shot the first one, and we met Johanna, who I thought was fantastic. And so I wanted to make more stuff with her. So we shot eight or nine days in January. Yeah, just about eight or nine in January. is ridiculous. It was freezing at night. Yeah. And then we cut that together, and then we shot, like, another 18 days in, in April or something. Yeah, towards summer when it was hot as hell. <laughs> it was still freezing on those mountains. I remember Johanna almost flew off of a mountain at some point in time. <laughs> And then, so how do you, you guys all, how do you build your, your producer team? How do you guys all know each other? Kind of give us context into relationships. Uh, Mike brought me on um, after they shot the first uh, eight or nine days in January. And I've just known Mike for a few years. He's a good friend of mine, and I guess he had some faith in me. So that's how I ended up on it. Well, yeah, Alex was brought in the second part, and we honestly could not have done the film without her. She's one of the most amazing people you could ever work with. So we're really grateful to have her for the film. I was on for the first part, and she, after she came on, everything just went so much smoother and easier. <laughs> and then do you guys, like there's other producers, Drea was one of them, I can kind of just talk about, is it people that you knew that then you referred to, kind of how did that team kind of come to be? I mean, we were kind of trying to piece it together. There was days that Fred couldn't be there, there was days that Alex couldn't be there. We got Drea to handle all the SAG stuff, because that's just like a whole other <laughs> nightmare in general. Um, no offense, um, but it's just like so like that side of it so much work. Paperwork so, is huge. Yeah, it's um, so just having someone to handle that and just making sure that we had a different person there every day to like take care of whatever kind of nightmare that might come up. Yeah, well we worked on a film before and like this, the producer that was supposed to do the SAG paperwork didn't do it, so we kept getting threatened to get shut down like every other day. And so when Drea came on board, she took care of all the SAG paperwork for us and it was just amazing, so she was great. 
And then, so how was it like, it sounded like you piecemealed your producers together because obviously you schedules and times and everything like that. When did it seem to work really well? And when it was like, oh my gosh, is this gonna, gonna work? Um, I guess when I came on, it was Otzi, Trinity, me, Fred, and then Dre was sort of like our SAG paperwork and back in LA producer. And um, yeah, I think things kind of came together from there. Like Trinity and Otzi were on spring break at different times, so they couldn't be there every day. And so it was just kind of what producer could be there at what time and what location and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like every day it was about to fall apart. So there was never a time <laughs> where I felt really good about it. <laughs> I mean, no. Really? It, 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 <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, every day was like some nightmare of something. Happening. That's the thing of independent. That's the thing of filmmaking, though. That's how it is. So then um, we're going to talk about that in a minute. We'll get there for sure because that's interesting. But I'm going to talk a little bit about we're still in the kind of pre-production mode. When it was a time to be like, okay, let's cast. How did how did you find Nicole? How did you guys what things like that? How was that process? I mean, I found Nicole on my film before this, which is called Pure Blossom Highway, and. Uh, I met with a bunch of casting directors and she was like the first one who we really clicked and I felt like she kind of got all the bad ideas I wanted to do. <laughs> so, um, and then from there, I don't know, you want to talk about Nicole? Yeah, so then what's your point of view on, on what you made say yes? <laughs> um, so I worked with Mike on uh, his previous film, Pear Blossom Highway, and then he, uh, which was, you know, it's the second in a trilogy with Little Rock. So he had done Little Rock without a casting director. And then Pear Blossom was sort of some of the same people, but he needed to bring, you know, additional cast on. And that was the first time he was working with a casting director. And then when he decided to do this, I helped, we started with the short film, as he said. So, um, and so really, initially I was just looking for Joanna. And then it was the additional parts that came on. So Mike works in a in a different kind of way. Uh, would you call it unique? I would say no, it's unique. I think unique. it's the most normal way to work. No? <laughs> <laughs> um, so because there's not really a script, it's more sort of this is these are some things I'm interested in exploring. This is the location we're going to be at, and then I always have to sort of make him write sides. Um, or just come up with a way to audition people. But, you know, the advantage of working with somebody more than once is that you really start to understand the kind of film that they're making, the kind of person that they're looking for, um, and it it's actually makes it much easier, even in working in sort of a non-traditional way, if you really understand the type of film that you're making, it cuts out a lot of... Uh, Waste of time, frankly. And then, because you talked about how it kind of changed a little bit from three stories to kind of extended one story, was there characters added in the middle of production? Were you guys in contact, or was all the kind of the characters and casting set from kind of day one? No, I mean we it was it was kind of piecemeal. Like once we had once we decided to focus on the one story, then there were additional characters added like the mother and um, the man who owns the house that they work on. Um, the woman at the grocery store. Right, the woman at the grocery store. So we did it sort of in sections, you know, after the first part was already shot. Um, so it's always a little bit sort of stop and start, but, you know, that's fine. So then, since it wasn't script-based or script-heavy, was it a lot of visual conversations? Was it a lot of feel, kind of what was the words or descriptions or kind of conversations you had around trying to figure out characters? Well, for casting, I mean, I, we would do a lot of improv, I think, right? Yeah, um, yeah. and Mike would just sort of say, like, I, I want this kind of person and the scene's going to be sort of like this. Um, and Mike's really open to trying out different things and different kinds of people. Um, but I would say that he def he definitely, there's a kind of person that he responds to, and it's a kind of a loose, improvisatory way of working. Um, you know, people who come in and really want to just say the lines as written, that's, you know, that's not the kind of person that he really responds to. So it's just a question of finding those people. And then so, kind of for the actors in the room, what, the actors that clicked, that kind of got that process, what stood out for you in, that, in doing that that would, maybe help an actor who has that situation in the future where maybe it's a little more improv-based versus script-based? Yeah, I mean, I think someone who comes in and makes like a strong choice, like one way or the other, even if it's not something I was expecting, to me is always um, 
the most exciting, like someone who takes something that you wrote and does something totally different with it, um, opposed to coming in and seeming super prepared and like too robotic or something. Um, I mean, definitely having someone who can think on their feet and make weird choices. I mean, I was like telling Nicole, like I was always looking for maniacs, like who was the craziest person she could find me. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, what were the, once the people auditioned, how did you, the, what was the conversation, it's always curious for actors, of how do you know that, that person's the one? What was that conversation around of like, was it look, feel, was it that kind of loose um, improv based on strong choices? How did you like, yep, that's my, my guy or gal? I don't know what, what happened, Nicole. I don't remember. I think it's it's a little bit of a combination of a couple of things. I mean, you know, the the process of finding um, JoJo was actually faster than you would. I think people always think that when you're looking for a young actor, it's really laborious and takes forever. Um, but uh, I think what Mike was looking for was so specific that we sort of cut through a lot of people really quickly. Um, but there was definitely moments where we would like two people a lot. Yeah. And it was this kind of arbitrary decision on which one was, you know. I mean, Johanna was the only one who came in where I was like, that's it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, that's true. Everybody else, was. there was a little bit more back and forth. And, you know, I think it's just a lot of sort of spending the time with the actor and Mike really being able to work with them. And th there was a lot of, like, okay, let's do it again, but this time, like, put the pages down and think, what if this happened, and working with them. Um, so it's, you know, it's a, it's a different sort of process, and I think some people really enjoy that, and some people don't, and sometimes it was just sort of, you know what, let's, I like both these people, what do you think? You know what, let's, let's give this person a shot, you know? Yeah, and I mean, it, it's all, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the people who came in, the one guy who came in as a ranch owner, and he was dressed up like a cowboy, I mean, that was really insane. Because um, he was so stiff and just reading the lines and had like a dress like a ranch hand because it said ranch hand, but even though it was just supposed to be like a rich guy who owned, which was cool that he dressed up, but it was super awkward. And like he read and it was horrific. I asked him to put it down and he read it again and it was still pretty bad. And then he just like stormed out of the room in his cowboy boots. Um, <clears throat> He requested maniacs, so, well, you know. I, know. <laughs> I probably should have cast him, actually. That was actually pretty cool. So then once kind of casting and you, you got your choices, then how close was casting into then production? Obviously, you were, some of it was in the middle of it, it sounded like. But when were you, when did you kind of start day one? I mean, for the first part, I think we started casting in um, December and shot in January. And then I think for the second part, maybe... Was it March or I think some of it? We were like right before we started in April. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean it was it was definitely pretty close. Um, but you know, I mean the the thing about doing a move a film this small is that in some ways you have no flexibility and in some ways you have a lot of flexibility. Um, so you know, I think we just sort of all kind of made it work as best we could. There was definitely a lot of scramble for like background and you know, all those parts. Um, but everything else, we were sort of able to pull it together. Did you guys um, have rehearsals or was it just everything done on set? I don't think, I don't think we rehearsed, did we, Roberta? Not really. I mean, I think they would show up and we would like uh, talk through scenes, like what should happen, kind of. Um, we would rehearse it in English. Um, and they would kind of improv stuff and the stuff that I liked, I would tell them that I liked it and then we would kind of go from there. Right, I think that's how we did it. I mean, do we rehearse Johanna? No, not so much. Johanna and I met at a, in a park one day and we talked about ideas and um, that's the day that she wrote the really beautiful story about her mom taking her to the snow, right? So I think Johanna should actually get a writing credit because yeah. she wrote some of the best, <laughs> best parts in the movie. Because none of us speak Spanish. I mean, we should be clear that uh, the actors speak Spanish, but none of us do. Um, then let's talk about it a little bit. Um, it sounds like you have a lot of stories, so. Um, which best ones do you have about kind of the behind the scene process for some of those shots? Um, this is a chance to kind of go, okay, stop five minutes of raining for us to get this shot or, you know what I mean, we, we were freezing but yet it looked like this. Kind of what was those kind of day-to-day -day issues that uh, any filmmaker kind of needs to know and was specific to your project? I don't know, the biggest nightmare story, what? Well, you could tell the Buster story, that one's kind of cute. Um, so Atsi and Mike, uh, 
came to set one morning. They're like, oh, last night we were up really late and we wrote this scene about we need a dog for tomorrow. And it's like, what? We need a dog now? <laughs> and later that day, um, we were shooting at that market and two dogs wandered up to set that were homeless. <laughs> it was just perfect timing. And I ended up keeping one of the dogs and our makeup artist kept the other dog who ended up in the shoot. So I guess that kind of worked out. That could have been really bad if the dogs hadn't have just shown up that day. Fred, do you get any ones where you're like, if you knew about this? Yeah, the wind. We're, you want to tell that one? Machine was got blown off the mountain. I mean, the scene when Johanna's like up on the mountain looking at his house, and it's like this like slow zoom at his house. I mean, it was like 60 mile per hour winds, and we had to have like a someone down there holding her feet because we were worried that she was going to fly off. Um, I don't know what else was that terrible day, Jojo. Ooh. Ooh. It was all bad for you, I know. <laughs> I think the bar scene was pretty rough for Roberto there. Uh, we sit next to a guy who was just telling you talking about the film while we were trying to shoot. I believe that happened. No, actually, I'll tell you a bad one. Uh, <laughs> Shit. I don't that being a script. Okay. So the audience can't hear Roberto. So can you can you share that story? What he just said. So we were when we got to the rich guy's house there he was supposed to be working. We like found all the horse shit, and so that was written in on the spot. And so uh, after the laughter and all that. Yeah, Roberto wasn't happy about having to do that, but. Yeah, but still didn't it. like you specifically say you'll do anything except shovel shit, and then I think like yeah. you had gotten a text with that, and Mike and I kind of looked at each other and we saw the horses. <laughs> like, the idea was there. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm curious from, from as much as you guys were improving with actors, I feel like producers, your job is just to be in the in the mode of improv of just whatever issue comes up, you just take care of it in the moment and make a way to work. What is it like to function in that kind of atmosphere, especially an independent film? Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, well, I was focus focusing on locations a lot. Um, so it was a lot of like dealing with government land permits and stuff like that. And then like a lot of sort of last minute um, location decisions, like kind of as the story was evolving. Um, and then like the hardest part of that was we didn't have internet out in the desert. So it was really hard to do any sort of like research for the next day's locations. And we were staying at just terrible Motel 6s out there. That Their internet was just terrible. So it was a lot of like just late nights trying to do research when you could, like on the computer and try to find time for some internet. So I guess like next time if we do this, like definitely getting some sort of like a uh, wireless device, I think that would be a lifesaver. So you could have internet in the middle of nowhere. How many, it, it was all shot in the desert, how many different locations um, within that? Um, it was like the shack, the market. Yeah. We were at the shack for I think four days. Mm -hmm. so that Dr. was like Far's one of the biggest land. one. Um, there's like this ranch that this guy owns out there, this like uh, Iranian filmmaker who somehow lives out in the desert and has this huge plot of land um, that we shot on, but he, it's like uh, you can use it for a bunch of different locations. It was like uh, Roberto's house and when they're doing the day labor work, right? Was out there. Um, so like five or six locations, I think, maybe. Um, what would your advice be? We're gonna kind of go down the line here and we'll go writer director with you, Mike, for anybody out there, actors and anybody else watching who thinking about doing their first feature film, what would your advice be to them? I mean, probably not to take any advice. <laughs> Can you expand on that a little bit more? I just mean, when I tried to make my first film, I got advice all the time that was terrible, and it was basically like, you can't make a movie, so um, I just wouldn't listen to anybody. Alex? Um, I guess <laughs> <laughs> having a really good team in place, um, you're going to be spending a lot of time with people in probably really shitty situations, like or weather-wise and location-wise, that you want to make sure that these are people that you want to hang out with and spend time with and get along with and value as artists, too. Or specifically shitty situations in your guys' case, too. So, Fred. I like how Roberto's pouting right now. <laughs> but um, I guess kill your ego. Don't come to set with an ego would be my biggest advice. Can you expand on a little bit, Matt? I think that's a really well, huge I mean, one. Well, I mean, Roberto had to end up shoveling horse shit. So, I mean, I think his ego got... He couldn't have an ego. Otherwise, he wouldn't have done that scene, I'd imagine. And... Um, you know, sometimes you got to pick up a boom and do boom work when you're a producer. Sometimes you got to do, you know, whatever it takes to get the scene shot. 
Nicole, what do you need from an, a director or a producer to make your job? You know, I think it, it sort of harkens to what Mike said. I think you have to have a really, a really great support team, and I think you have to have a really great plan and vision of what you want to do, and then you have to be able to completely throw away any one of those visions or ideas because in the moment, you know, it's like if you can't get that location, especially when you're working with really, really, really low budget, you know, you could have this great idea of this, you know, fantastic house that you're going to shoot in and at the last minute you could lose the house and you've got to be able to have the flexibility to say, okay, well, we'll now you, you don't have the time to sit around and ponder finding another place. You've got to be able to say, okay, well, what, what's the, what's the real essence of what we're trying to do and how can we do it in another place or in another way or without that actor or without that light or with that, you know, you just have to have that kind of flexibility. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about post, but I want to do it through the lens of like funding. Um, were you able, from pre all the way to post, was it, were you able to fund? Was there any funding in the middle that you had to do? And then kind of talk a little bit about post into like film festivals. How was that process for this film for you? I mean, we did a Kickstarter somewhere in there. I don't know like at what point we did that. It was um, right before, so we started filming the second part March 16th. And I think it ended, our Kickstarter ended like, I think like a week into that. And that was purely for the second, and second half? It was yeah. the goal? Yeah. And then I think from there, um, like we had enough to finish the movie. We took the film to this uh, festival in Poland where they show like five work in progresses, which we won like a bunch of post-production funds to pay to finish it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's, and then we had our uh, our sound mixer, on-set sound mixer actually did sound design for the film too, okay. so, and he's amazing, so we got really, really lucky on that one, so shout out to Jan if you're watching right now, thank you. Hmm. Got fans in the audience, Jan. Um, great, I, um, I think that's a great place to end, so I want to say thank you to them for, for coming out and thank sharing you. their story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Oh, we have posters, too, so if you guys want some posters. want a poster of the movie, yeah, yeah you can come up with a bunch of posters. Yeah. So thank you all. Make thank sure to fill the surveys. Thanks to SAG and Dennis for having us. Yeah, thank you so you're much. welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.